Dear Father, we thank you so much. I just hearing good, good Father and, and just remembering that you are a father to the fatherless. Lord, you can change the mindset, change the perception of us no matter what situation we're in. We can be in the depths of hell and see heaven from it because you're there with us, Lord. So, Father, we pray that we keep our minds set on you, we keep our sights set on you, Lord, and we keep our lives running hard after you, Father. In that way, we can be exceptions in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, as you guys know, Tuesday is a big day. I'm going to go ahead and get this out of the way. Um, we are voting. And, you know, as I was thinking about putting this message together, it's, it's, it, it could go in a whole number of different directions. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't get caught up in this socio-political tornado and miss out on sharing the message that God really wanted us all to hear. So I will say this about Tuesday. Along with our privilege and responsibility to vote, I want you to know that there is a freedom there. There, 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 there is something there that not many other countries around the world have. That opportunity to choose. That opportunity to know that every single vote truly matters. It's not manipulated by those uh, who are in power, who are corrupted. Truly every vote matters. And yet you still have this choice. You can vote for one of the major candidates. You can write someone in or you can choose not to vote at all. I only ask this, that no matter what you choose as a Christian, make sure the choice comes out of your conviction that is covered in scripture, blanketed in prayer, and that as accurate as you can make it, the information, as much information about each candidate that you can. And anyway, we got to remember that no human-led government is meant to last forever anyway. When it's all said and done, God is going to rule. He's going to have an eternal, theocratic monarchy. And I don't think anybody who is under his rule will be complaining. Or at least me as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, I won't be complaining. So then I find it kind of surprising when I read my Bible and I find individuals and nations who are intimate related to God, who are in that kind of relationship where God regularly provides for them, does miraculous things for them, walks with them, that they find any reason to complain or be dissatisfied with God. But of course, when you do something like this and you read the Bible to, to grow from it, you take a look at your own life, don't you? And as I'm sitting here criticizing people like the Israelites and, and other people in the Bible, I start to look at my own life and I realize that I'm not too unlike those that I'm criticizing. I think I told you before at one time I graduated from seminary back in 2012. And after that, I expected God to immediately lay down my next assignment on my lap. Well, he did lay it in my lap. It just took two years. And during that two-year time frame, I was a gentle, patient, good little saint. I know you're laughing because you know that's a lie, right? <laughs> I must admit, for the most part, I was a sniveling, depressed little brat. I did not really see God the way I should have. And so, like the Israelites in the wilderness wondering, I complained, I grumbled. But I don't want to be that way. My desire, and if, if I would be so bold... I think your desire also. 
are to be people who represent God faithfully. So then the question is, how do we do that? How do we do that? How, do we, how are we able to live lives free of complaint, free of faithlessness, free of uh, 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 just unbelief? We got to be exceptions. We got to be exceptions. And that's the title today of this sermon, Be the Exception. So what, what does that look like? How can we be exceptions? Well, I'm glad you asked because one of my favorite people in the Bible is Caleb. And if you've known me for at least 10 minutes, or you've probably heard me talk about Caleb. But the, the thing about Caleb is in the face of severe social peer pressure, he was able to maintain his trust and his faith in God. So we're going to dive into Caleb's headspace and figure out what, what, what it was that made him different from all the other Israelites. And I think three things that we can pull out that will help us see how to be exceptions about Caleb, and I believe every believer can be an exception, is one, Caleb was able to see differently. He was able to see differently than all the other Israelites. Two, he was able to think differently than all the other Israelites. And three, because of the other two, he was able to live differently than all the rest of the Israelites. Caleb's perception and outlook, the way he saw things, was very different than the other Israelites. And we can tell this because if you remember, if you recall, when they came into the wilderness of Paran, or Paran, I'm trying to get my uh, enunciation right. When they came to the wilderness of Paran, God commanded Moses to send 12 spies to spy at the land, right? And each scout was a representative of each tribe. And Caleb got chosen. Now, I want, I'm a, actually, I'm jumping ahead a little bit because I want, this is important. I want you to know this about Caleb. Did you guys know that he was a Gentile? Yes. Caleb wasn't originally part of the tribe of Judah. He's a Kenizzite. I don't know if it happened, you know, the mixed multitude that came out of Egypt or somewhere along the way when they bumped into one of the uh, tribes along the, the wilderness uh, wandering. Maybe he married into the tribe or maybe his tribe was absorbed into the tribe of Judah. But originally, Caleb is not a Judahite. He is not part of the people of Israel. Now, what kind of man did he have to be to be chosen as a leader among the Israelites. This man is originally an outsider. What kind of life of integrity must he have lived, a life of influence, positive influence on the nation of Israel, that he was chosen as one of the 12 to represent a tribe? So they gather up the 12, they go out and they spy the land. Now, I can pretty much say this factually, that Caleb saw the same things as the other 10 spies. Because they went and they went to the same land. They grabbed the same grapes. They saw the same Anakim and Canaanites. But when they came back, they had conflicting reports, didn't they? What was different? What was different about Caleb that his report didn't line up with the other ten? Well, I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 13. Starting at verse 25, and as you do, I'm going to give you some background as you're turning. So keep your ears open and your fingers moving. So the Israelites came through. Um, there were slaves in Egypt, came through the Red Sea, traveled about 400 miles on this course, this route that led them south and then up back north. They ended up a little bit south of the promised land in the wilderness of Paran. And so here God tells Moses to send out 12 spies. And this is where we start to see this divergence. If you're at verse 25, we'll read. We'll go through verse 33. At the end of 40 days, when they returned from spying out the land, they came to Moses and Aaron. 
and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses. Because you can tell as they're giving this bad report, God is sending them into this land. And all of a sudden, the tenant giving this bad report, what starts this murmuring? Oh, well, I thought God was giving us this. Caleb's like, settle down, settle down. Verse 30, but Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are able to overcome it. He said, let's go up now, now. 31, then the man who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against these people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we were going to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that saw it in it, that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. Did you catch that? The ten spies agreed that the land was indeed bountiful. But then they said, you see, Moses, there's some folks living there. And they won't take too kindly to us laying claim in their land. And I just don't think we can whoop them. But Caleb says, wait a minute. We can go up there immediately and occupy this land. Now, which one is it? Are they stronger than us? Or can we go up and take the land? Well, it depends. Now, if you set your sights on your difficulties and your hardships, it becomes very easy to give up on something, doesn't it? But if you set your sights on the goal, on the prize, on the reward, you're more likely to finish the job. And these are the two opposing perceptions that we have between the 10 spies and Caleb. The 10 are looking at the difficulties, the hardships. I'm sure after, oh, oh Lord, we wandered through the wilderness for over a year. You know, they wandered for a year, you know, they had kids, so you know they had to make stops because any trip gets longer when you get kids going with you, right? <clears throat> But actually, they stopped when the pillar stopped. You know, they actually was following the Lord. I don't want to. (laughs) But you do stop a lot more when you have kids with you. (laughs) And it's like, we go, we go, we wander through this wilderness for over a year. And we just thought we could just walk right into the promised land. Isn't that the way you were going to do it, God? You know, just make it easy for us. Caleb went out there and said, mm, oh, yeah, I see those guys. Mm, look at this. Look at these. Oh, Lord has given us something good. He ain't paid no mind. He ain't paid no mind to the Anakim. He didn't care because his eyes were on the prize. And he knew who was going with him. And the other Israelites had forgotten. And they said, and I want you to see the, um, the um, placement of this. They said first, in verse 33, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and then we did to them. See, they first perceived themselves as grasshoppers, small, easily squished, and then their mindset got transferred to those around them. I wonder if they thought differently about themselves, if the other people would. You remember as they traveled through the, wandering, the wilderness wanderings? This wasn't a uh, surprise. The reputation of God had already gone out. 
People knew about the Israelites. And well, how did other people groups react it when they heard the Israelites were coming through? They were scared. They were scared to hear that the Israelites were coming by their way because they knew that their God traveled with them. This was new. This one knew that a, that, a, that a God actually traveled with his people and worked for them everywhere they went. They were used to having God here and a God here and a God there and a God there. They, they, they're not used to this new God who, who comes around everywhere, messing everything up. But see, what happened is the Israelites lost sight of that. But not Caleb. Caleb and Joshua, man, them boys were pumped. They're like, we've been traveling through this wilderness, man. Hey, look at them grapes. I'm hungry. Let's go. Let's take this land. So then now my question to you is, what is your perception of your own life? How and in what way do you face the difficulties and the hardships that you're going to Because it is impossible. If you are a human being, one of the very concepts of being human is going through hardships. Suffering will come upon all of us. So how are you going to approach it? Are you going to be blinded by the challenges and problems in your life that you can't see any way out? And you're going to be like me, grumbling and complaining to God about every little thing that goes wrong? Or are you going to lift your eyes a little higher? I think about that psalm, I will lift my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. That's the King James Version, sorry. My help comes from the Lord. Lift your eyes a little higher and see who is walking with you through those difficulties. And if you set your sights on the Lord because he offers you protection and rest, then your mind and your heart will be at ease through the difficulties you go through. And that just don't make no sense. How can you be going through something and be at peace? That just makes no sense. Why? Because we see differently. We're not focused on our problems. We're focused on our Lord. And when the world sees this, they will marvel. They will say, that's an exceptional way to view things. Now, because... Your perception will be different. The way you see things will be different. Then the way you think about things will be different. I love this quote from John Milton when he said, The mind is its own place and in itself can make heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. How you think about something. Now, they're bringing this report to the nation of Israel. It doesn't take long to figure out which side the people choose. We're going to skip to Numbers 14. It's probably the next verse. Chapter 14, verse 1. And here's where I want to rest a little bit. Because they took the democratic approach, didn't they? Majority rule. More spies say we can't do it. Let's go with them, right? You know, uh, I wasn't going to put this quote in, but I think it's appropriate right now. Um, what was it Winston Churchill that says, democracy is the worst, worst form of government except for all the others that are tried from time to time? <laughs> There's no government that is good enough because it's ran by sinful people. <laughs> so if we're looking to find deliverance from government, we're barking up the wrong tree. Majority vote rules, so they went with the 10. Listen, listen to this. It's this pathetic display of unbelief. Verse 1 of chapter 14. Then all the congregation, they, they always raising a loud cry. Have <laughs> you ever noticed that? The people of God are always raising a loud cry. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled. And actually, what that word means, it's much stronger than that. They didn't just grumbled. It says blamed. They blamed God for where they were. 
Isn't it funny how everybody doesn't believe in God, that something goes wrong, do you want to blame him for everything? Why does God allow this? This isn't right. I'm a good person. No, you're not. You're lucky that your heart is still beating and your lungs are still pumping. You're blessed. You're blessed. But here they are grumbling, blaming God against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Oh, would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Oh, would that we had died in the wilderness. What in the world? Don't you know that as long as you're alive, there's still a chance? What are they talking about? Would that we had died? Wait, wait, wait. Now, again, I'm, I'm going off the beaten path a little bit. Did, did, didn't they, what they, didn't they see the ten plagues? Did, didn't they see... Now, you got to understand, at that time, Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world, not Canaan. They were enslaved by the most powerful nation in the world. Didn't they see God do 10 plagues and, and, and deliver them? And didn't they see him open up the, the walls of the Red Sea and they walked through? Didn't they see him provide for them that whole wilderness? What? How all of a sudden, now, they can't trust God. But see, that's key. It wasn't all of a sudden, was it? No, 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 no. This, this falling away, this, this uh, unbelief happened over the course of time. It wasn't a precipitous drop down a cliff. It was a slow roll down the hill. Disobedience and disobedience. And we can see that because God says later in chapter 14, these 10 times, have you, he even numbered it, these 10 times, have you tested me? If you go back to chapter 12, just one chapter before where we started, Miriam and Aaron opposed Moses from marrying a black woman. And they said, you think you're the only one God speaks through? They were racist. Let's call it what it is. They were racist. And this is just before going to the wilderness of Perim. So this wasn't, oh, oh, we just all of a sudden don't believe. They have long before turned their hearts away from the Lord. This is just a straw that broke the camel's back. See, we all think, oh, God's grace, oh, yeah, it lasts forever. Let's just float along and do nothing. Let's not listen to the Lord because he forgives our sins anyway. Let's say the prayer and know that we're going to heaven and be disobedient for the rest of our lives. No, 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 no. God's fuse has an end. It's long. But it has an end. And right here, this time, this level of disobedience, this time of rebellion, this time of unbelief, enough's enough. I was a fan of Popeye when I was a kid. He was one of my favorite cartoons. And if you're a millennial, you have probably have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but Popeye was this hero and he would put up with Bluto for a while, and then he'll get to this point where he says, that's all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. <laughs> I think God is saying, that's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. So here we are. Democratic vote, but yet it led to rebelling against God. And isn't it interesting that with 10 plagues, God freed the people, but yet 10 acts of disobedience condemned them? I thought that was interesting. So, how do Caleb and Joshua, Joshua's, Joshua's that's why I have included him with the 10, Joshua is hanging with Caleb now. They're boys, they're the dynamic duo. How do they respond now to the people siding with the majority vote? Verse 5, I'm glad you asked. 
Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. That is amazing. If God had walked with me, and God had chosen me to be the intermediary between the people and him, and they started walling out like that, I would have said, God, hit them with a giant boulder, swallow them in the earth again, do so. Moses fell on his face. That's a sign of humility. He was a humble leader. He fell on his face. Joshua, the son of Nun, verse 6, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spread out the land, tore their clothes. That's a, that's a sign of shame. What are we doing, guys? Listen, he's trying to get their attention. What are you doing? Have you forgotten who God is? And they said, verse 7, to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we passed through the spot out, it's an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Yes, we understand now. We're pumped up again. Let's go take this land. That is not what happened. The people said, let's stone them. (laughs) You want to assassinate the leaders of your country now. They have gone off the deep end. But look at the perception. The other 10, they were like grasshoppers to themselves and 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 the inhabitants of the land were like giants. But to Caleb and Joshua, the inhabitants of the land were bread. It gets no softer than a loaf of Sarah Lee. Oh, my goodness. They said, let's go in there. What are you doing? And the people said, let's kill them. Not only that, they said, let's reelect new leaders. This is, all a, uh, this is all a governmental political thing going on, by the way. You want to talk about political? This whole message. Let's reelect new leaders and let us, them lead us back to slavery. Yeah! <laughs> mm. And then you wonder why Moses wasn't able to enter the land. He got fed up. <laughs> He he didn't know what to do with them anymore. Are you kidding me? So let me ask you a question. Does your thought life have you moving forward with the Lord? Or are you backtracking or even standing still because your thought life is paralyzing you? What is your outlook on the future? Is it one like Caleb's, knowing that With the Lord, anything is possible, no matter where you are, no matter where you stand right now? Or is it like the Israelites and you're enslaved by worldly thinking? Are we spending our time grumbling and complaining about every little thing that happens in our lives? Have we become too comfortable that we don't know how to handle suffering? Here's a few passages about thinking. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the Democrats or Republicans. No! Raised against the knowledge of God. And take every thought captive to obey Christ. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. When you vote this Tuesday, think about these things. After the results, think about these things. Wash and renew your heart and mind in the word of God.
Where do you go when an issue arises, when a challenge pops up? Do you go to the Lord in prayer and seek guidance and wisdom from him? Do you run to the first worldly resource that is available to you? God may eventually lead you that way, and that's okay. But did you seek his guidance first? God is not a last resort. If how we see things and the way we think about things is going to be different, then naturally how we behave and carry ourselves is going to be different. We end up living differently than others who are not all in with God. So now, how do we know this about Caleb? Okay, you don't have to turn there. I'm going I'm to I'm talk about it because we're, we're getting on time. But God pardoned the people. He was going to wipe them out, just in case if y'all didn't know that. God was done. <laughs> Moses prayed for the people and said, Lord, by your name, by your name, you must carry this through because this is a promise that you made to the people. And God says, okay, I will pardon them, but here is the deal. They will not enter the land. There's no way I'm giving them knuckleheads this land. They're done. They will die in the wilderness like they want. Isn't that what they asked for? What did we would die in the wilderness? God said, okay. Oh, man. (laughs) Be careful what you pray for. (laughs) And here's the deal. God didn't put Caleb and Joshua on cryo sleep for 40 years. The righteous suffered with the unrighteous. That's going to happen sometimes, ladies and gentlemen. God is going to pronounce judgment at times, and that judgment will leak unto the righteous. And I don't think God has been mean. But now that we see differently and we think differently, the way we respond to God's judgment is going to be different than everybody else, and they will take notice. So, 40 years, wandering in the wilderness, first generation dies off. Caleb and Joshua are now in their 80s, or close to it, somewhere around in there, 80 years old. They weren't exempt from the bad choices that the other people made. And we can grumble and complain and be like everybody else and say, that's not fair, I chose the right thing, they didn't listen to me, see, I told you so. That is not what Caleb did at 80-some years old. When they allotted the land, Caleb got Hebron. And guess where those little stinky Anakim were that everybody was afraid of? Hebron. You think Caleb said, I'm old now, we can't do it. Why you give me Hebron now? He said, you know what? I'm 85, I think it's 85 years old. I can fight like I'm 40. Give me that land, the Lord will be with me. Caleb was one of the few people who actually cleaned house on his allotted land. One of the few. Most of them weren't even able to finish the job, but he was. See, Caleb had a different way of viewing things. It changed into a different way of thinking, resulted in a different way of living. Think about this situation going into uh, Protect the land. You got two baby boomers leading a whole nation of Gen Xers, Millennials, and Gen Zers. What in the world? (laughs) But they had God with them. They had God with them. And I think Caleb would be one of those types of people who would say, he would ask for something. I don't think he would be, you know, this false humility. He would ask for something, but he would end it with, but Lord, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. This is the Lord's assessment of Caleb. If you turn to verse 24 of chapter 14. This is what the Lord said of Caleb. He said, my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit, and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. 
Caleb followed the Lord fully. That doesn't mean he was perfect. But what I think it means is there was no area of Caleb's life that was untouched by the sovereignty of God. Everything about Caleb, his mind, his heart, his soul, his body, his entire life, he devoted, excuse me, he devoted to God. And he lived it out that way. So now, how do we become exceptions in this world? We must see differently. As we vote Tuesday and as we live the years after that, regardless of the results, We see differently. And then we think differently. God has a plan. He has not abandoned us regardless of what happens. God has a plan. And it is not to destroy us. We know that. We know we have a happily ever after. Whether we die now or we hear when the Lord comes. If you are in Christ, you know you have a happily ever after. And then that should cause us to live differently among the people of America and the world. They need to see unity in the church. They need to see love between the brothers and sisters of Christ in the church. They need to see fervor and passion for God out in this world. Loving our enemies. Let us be the exception. Let us be of a different spirit and follow the Lord fully. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord. You are a gracious God. You are a patient God. You're also a righteous and holy God. You have expectations of your people, and rightly so. You have given us life when we were dead. When we abandoned and and left you, you restored the relationship. We owe you ourselves, Lord, and ourselves is all that we can give to you. So I pray, Lord, that as we think about this upcoming political season and voting and everything else, let us not be swayed by all of the fear that that is shared among us from the world, but let us see differently. Let us see differently that you are still working. You are sovereign. You raise kings up and you bring them down. Let us think differently, Lord, that we can trust you, that we can rely on you. You are trustworthy. It is okay, regardless of what we're going through. We know that all our circumstances are not going to be favorable, but you promise to be with us through all our circumstances. And then we live differently. We live differently. We live lives that are like your son, Jesus Christ, who walked the earth, Lord. We have the example. We know what's required. By your spirit, Lord, we can do it. And for anyone who is on the outside of Christ and not in him, Lord, you offer freely the gift of salvation. If anyone is wanting to accept that gift today, find someone to talk to, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.